Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 651 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 22nd of October 2022 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Shane Miller about writing beginnings, what you need in the beginning of your novel so your reader wants to read on or buy or borrow your book. We also talk about what it takes to make a success of your books, as Shane came storming out of the gate earlier this year with rapid releasing a number of fiction and non-fiction books. And in my recent survey, which uh, just is full of good ideas for what you want to know, many people asked to hear from newer authors, because obviously I started like a long time ago now. <laughs> and so people wanted to hear from newer authors how they're managing rather than just hearing from the more established names. So Shane talks about his publishing and marketing choices. And we also discuss what hasn't changed since I started and what has and the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, so it was Frankfurt Book Fair last week, which is the biggest trade fair for publishing and also the largest rights licensing fair. And I've been several times and it is aimed at publishers. So you get a perspective you don't get from author events, since most of the people there don't create the books, as in they don't write the books, they sell and license them. So it's far less emotional (laughs) and far more business-like, which is why I quite enjoy these fairs. They give you a real perspective of what what it's like as a business. London Book Fest is the same, but Frankfurt is huge. So one article in Publishing Perspectives had comments from agents at Frankfurt about what they're looking for and what is selling at the moment, which I thought was interesting. One comment was that an agent said, I think people are more and more looking for long sellers instead of only best sellers and books that can work in different formats. I love that. And I really hope that publishing does switch to this kind of model, this focus on long sellers rather than the spike sales of debut authors or even not debut authors. The expectation that an author will, you know, a book will be published, whether it's traditional or indie, and then in the first week it will sell gazillions. That's just not the way of things really anymore because the the model has has changed. And unless you are absolutely everywhere all at once, that won't happen. But actually, I mean, you can see this. I mentioned Colleen Hoover last week, but with her books, some of the books that are in the you know the top of the charts now are years old. So we ca- we can't think that books are, are spoiled or are somehow bad if they don't sell tons in the first week or month or whatever. And this is also one of the big differences between indie and traditionally published authors. And if you're new to the indie space, I feel like there's a little bit of feeling like it has to be that way. But once you've been in this model for a while, you realise that it's more about backlist and readers and the the indie author income is more about month by month income, more like a salary almost uh, that you get every month rather than a big spike uh, and then it disappears, which can happen with traditional publishing. If you get a big advance, it might be split over a few payments, but you'll get it and then it goes again rather than the sort of monthly sustainable payments payments. So yeah, other comments from Frankfurt. I see recent trends continuing into 2023, such as cosy crime. (laughs) International editors, so this is for foreign rights deals, are looking for series in the genre and also comfort fiction. So cosy mystery authors, you still are in demand. Cosy mystery is definitely one of the biggest genres, uh, I have found found myself reading Richard Osman. Uh, If you're in the UK, you will definitely hear of him and he's selling all over the place now. Certainly cosy mystery. So also readers want uplifting, big, epic stories in wonderful, unique and exotic settings with important messages. Not too much to ask, eh? (laughs) Uh, and, And another trend is how to find meaning 
and gentleness in this turbulent, uncertain world. What I like about that second one, meaning and gentleness, that is, that none of these are prescriptive in a way of it must have this type, you know, be this type of genre. I think meaning and gentleness is interesting. I mean, like I keep recommending, I'm going to recommend it here too. I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but a book called The Change by Kristen Miller. I love, love, love this book and I'm recommending it to all women of midlife <laughs> because it's an empowering book. It's, it's, it's like a magical realism. I think it would be the genre, but also it's kind of a thriller um, sort of revenge thriller almost, but it uh, it's empowering. And so it's got an emotional message which goes beyond the story. And I think those books are hard to write, to be sure. Um, and yeah. Okay, what else? I thought I thought it was really interesting. And I'll link to this in the show notes. There's loads more things that people are looking for. I only just picked a few of them. So check that out. Uh, it's from Publishing Perspectives. I will put link in the notes. So I'm kind of merging the futurist section now with normal publishing section because it really is a now thing rather than a future thing. But lots of you have sent comments and thoughts on the AI episode with Derek and many people with thoughts on how the copyright side might shake out. And given the media attention, so thank you for a start for everyone who shared um, and given the media attention, it's unsurprising <laughs> that Adobe announced this week, so Adobe obviously do Photoshop, uh, they're looking to incorporate AI generation, but in a way that also helps artists. The Content Authenticity Initiative is an Adobe-led initiative with more than 800 partners working to increase trust online. The open source technology enables creators to attach provenance data to digital content, helping ensure that creators get credit for their work. And those who view a piece of content understand who made it and how it was created and edited. Uh, basically, integrating generative AI. And they say generative AI will be is a hyper competent creative assistant. It will multiply what creators can achieve by presenting new images and alternative approaches, but it can never replace what we value in art, human imagination, an idiosyncratic style and a unique personal story. This is exactly what I've been talking about for years. And, you know, I have this this course, the AI assisted author. It's never about the easy button which outputs a book. And even if it could be or outputs a a picture, which it, it, it can be, but you still need to prompt it. And the point is the human direction is what will help AI become this hyper competent creative assistant. Now, I love what Adobe is saying, and this uh, content authenticity initiative, this is exactly what hopefully we'll be talking about for um, writing. And uh, I talked to Roni Levy earlier this year about how they're doing this for copyright in Canada and looking at doing this for authors and, and other IP. So yeah, I want this. I want both things. I want amazing generative AI across the creative industries and I want a thriving ecosystem for creators. So this space is moving very, very fast and I, <laughs> I fully expect like within a year the conversation will just be yeah yeah of course of course you use generative ai that's just part of the process so I, from last year where it was hate 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 this is awful this is awful and right now we're we're getting a bit of a balance of both and i, I think it won't be very long until this is just a normal part of our tools like we not you know a lot of people just use grammarly pro writing aid and there's no kind of comment about whether or not you should use it it's like a useful tool or whether you you know obviously the internet can be awful or it can be amazing same thing there's no no comment comment that we're going to carry on using it. So just a couple of tweets. I love this one from Christopher Russell. He said, I just listened to your recent in between episode uh, and am now obsessed, all caps, with Mid Journey. I made an image for one of my wife's many books and I'm so excited to use it on ads. It's only my second prompt. I think I found my calling. <laughs> and Christopher just it's super, super excited. And also Helen Morris says, being an illustrator and author, I was sceptical about listening to the podcast with Derek Murphy, but I surprised myself how much I enjoyed it. Thanks for introducing me to the wonders of AI. And yeah, so Helen Morris is an illustrator and author, and I've, I've got one of her books, actually. Thank you, Helen. And Helen, I 
thank you also for being open enough to listen to that episode. I think that's what we we have to do this. We have to open ourselves up to these ideas. Also, I'm going to mention it, NFTs. Uh, because potentially about to go mainstream in publishing. Last week, I noted that Ingram invested in Book.io, which is an NFT marketplace for buying, reading, selling ebooks and audiobooks as, on, as NFTs. And they have this cool mint and print idea, which ties a physical edition nicely to the digital edition. Well, this week, Book.io also received investment from venture capital firm BDMI, which is owned by Bertelsmann, which is a huge media company, which also owns Penguin Random House, as reported by Yahoo Finance. And um, Publishers Marketplace have finally discovered NFTs. Thad McElroy has done a piece there and also on his own website. Thad's been on the show uh, years back now, but um, his site is The Future of Publishing. And he now he's picked it up and written a piece in Publishers Marketplace once. And he did that last year uh, with AI Voice. And I feel like once Publishers Marketplace actually takes some of these things seriously, (laughs) uh, it's interesting. Also, the article says the company Book.io is in discussion with all five of the major publishers and three dozen other publishers. So this is all ramping up. And given that this is ramping up, so let's say that within a year or two years or even three years, publishing is now putting out NFT editions of books, limited editions or special editions or whatever they're doing. This is again, (laughs) you know, these are digital. And this is where you have to be wary of the contracts you sign. Now, repeat along with me. What don't we sign? We don't sign all rights existing now and to be invented for the life of copyright or the term of copyright, because (laughs) we don't know what the formats are going to be. Now, NFT rights are complicated, which I discussed with copyright lawyer Catherine Goldman in episode 613, because they are digital. So if you've signed digital rights, they might be included. They are ebooks, they are audiobooks. So if you are traditionally published and you've signed a contract for these things, you may not be able to mint NFT editions until you sort out contractuals. I foresee interesting times ahead when it comes to digital rights in contracts. And if you're new to NFTs and you are interested, check out my solo episode 610 from earlier this year when I go into creativity, collaboration, community and cash. A more detailed explanation on NFTs for authors. And in November, I will have a update on where things are and a discussion on that. So in useful stuff, if you'd like help with your writing and your author business, check out the Writing Career Toolkit Bundle at storybundle.com forward slash writing, which you might also find useful if you're prepping for NaNoWriMo. It includes ebooks on world building, writing short fiction, 30 day writing challenges, indie publishing for profit, selling books at live events, story structure, accounting for authors, writing for TV, million dollar outlines, stop worrying, start selling, and it also also includes my how to write a novel plus more books. With Story Bundle, it's a pay what you like deal and you get the ebooks delivered immediately so you can start reading and learning. Just go to storybundle.com forward slash writing available for a limited time. And in my personal update, I have finally done my solo Camino podcast, A Pilgrim in the Path of History, which is out now on my Books and Travel podcast. So if you just, uh, in your podcast app, just go to Books and Travel, uh, you can put pen in as well, P-E-N-N. Uh, that should make it come up. And yes, it is uh, it is a pilgrim in the path of history. And I, I definitely needed a month to kind of figure out what it meant. <laughs> but I'm happy with doing that solo episode because it's also helped me move ahead with my pilgrimage book, which I've definitely been struggling with. I mean, I've never really written this kind of more confessional memoir style writing. And while Normally, I would just like sit down and do 2000 words. That's not how it works with this memoir stuff. And those of you who write memoir, you totally get this, right? And I think poetry is probably the same. You don't just sit down and write 2000 words. (laughs) There's a lot of 
different thinking about it. And it's also, like I said, it's quite confessional. It's very personal. I, you know, I'm going to have chapters on the history of, you know, sort of my faith history my and, and what I think about sort of religious and spiritual things and my experiences and um, some just, just a lot more deep and meaningful personal stuff, which feels really hard to write. It's, it's difficult to know where the balance is. But also I have changed my book title, my subtitle. So the book will now be called Pilgrimage, Lessons Learned from Solo Walking Three Ancient Ways. So it's much more of um, uh, both the emotional side of pilgrimage and spiritual, but also the practical. I just can't help myself. I like writing self-help, <laughs> self-help and practical. So there will be, it's it, it's just going to be a mishmash of all of that. I think it's going to be a cool book though. So if you are interested, I am going to do some like limited edition hardbacks, which I'll sign and send out. So I don't know how I'm going to do that yet, but if you want to uh, be notified about all this, obviously I'll talk about it on the show, but I'll do some extra stuff for people who are really interested. So jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage, jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage if you're interested. And I would expect to launch that in Feb- around February 2023. Uh, yes. Also, I will be doing some live events. So again, with my survey, uh, overwhelmingly people want some live online Zoom workshops on your author business plan. So I am doing three workshop sessions at different times of day. So it works for all time zones. Yes, Australians, New Zealanders, people in Asia. (laughs) You will be able to come to one of them. I'm doing one at like 7am UK time. So that's aimed at um, that those time zones. So go to thecreativepen.com forward slash live just L-I-V-E, and you'll see the links. Um, There's three for your author business plan and uh, there are only limited seats. It is £50 and it is limited seats. I will not be selling the recordings. These are workshops where I'll be doing part presentation and explaining things and then you'll be doing some writing. Uh, So that'll be like a two hour workshop online and it will include some Q&A. And uh, and if you're an introvert, it's okay. You can just keep your camera off and do the writing and that's fine. Uh, So yeah, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash live. Thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments over the last week or so. It's been fun to see all your pictures. Uh, also, I, I wanted to share this tweet from Edwin Downward, longtime listener to the show. Hi, Edwin. He says, your futurist segments alone have helped me keep my hopes and fears of where tech is taking us in balance. Enough to, as you say, surf the wave rather than be crushed by it. Thank you, Edwin. And I appreciate your kind words because sometimes I wonder how much to share about this stuff and I just so you know I don't share everything because sometimes it's uh, it's a bit much <laughs> but I share things that I hope people will find useful. Uh, L Lahois, hi L, says evening walk listening to the podcast How Creativity Rules the World sent a lovely picture of the sunset on the river and Nay Kayla says wanted you to let you know I loved yesterday's episode on creativity I listened while working my day job outside Gettysburg PA that's Philadelphia right enjoy the full view it was a great birthday gift Uh, lovely red autumn trees in that photo and then finally just so you know you don't have to send me beautiful pictures (laughs) Emily Robertson uh, also long time listener said uh, listening to the show while waiting in the carpool line for Junior Cotillion dancing and etiquette lessons what do we think the 11 year old boys will report and sent a picture of the car dashboard in a (laughs) in a line of cars so brilliant i love to see pictures of where you're listening to the show whether they are beautiful or not (laughs) so tweet me at the creative pen with a double n and uh, or email me joanna at the creative pen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the youtube channel i love to hear from you it makes this more of a conversation So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark, which I use to print and distribute my self-published print books wide. Because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. And of course, I mentioned uh, Ingram Content Group, who have now invested in Book.io. So it'd be interesting to see if we can do even more with our content at some point through Ingram. So if you publish through Ingram Spark, you will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, 
libraries, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, as well as Bookshop.org, which became very popular in the pandemic, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and loads of independent stores in the USA. Of course, it means your books will be available to order, but you will still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I have had many of many people send me pictures of my print books in libraries, and also I've sold them at book fairs, conventions, and in physical stores. And that just doesn't happen unless you have discounts, which is what Ingram enables. You can choose to use returns, but it's certainly not necessary, and I don't use them. You can also choose your discount percentage. You can bulk order, so. If you want back of the room copies for live events or if you work direct with schools or bookstores or companies, I have had several bookstores uh, in the USA particularly order through me direct and then I buy the books direct on Ingram and send them to the customer. So if you want your books available for bookstores and libraries, schools and universities, go wide with your print books. It's your content. Do more with it. Head on over to ingramspark.com. Also, I have a special code you can use. You get one free book upload, print, ebook or both if uploaded at the same time. If you use promo code PEN, P-E-N-N, all caps at checkout for that one free book upload before December the 31st, 2022. So use promo code PEN, P-E-N-N at checkout for one free book upload before December 31st, 2022. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my patrons and especially the in between episodes. My patrons enable me to do this and I know it is a difficult time. So I absolutely appreciate uh, patrons of the show. Thanks to new patrons this week, Jessica Mehring, Magdalena Pontus and Glenn Nock. And thanks to returning patrons as well. And those of you who pop in and out of patronage over time. I know things change and, uh, you know, economics change that's for sure (laughs) so thank you for continuing to support the show you can support the show with just a couple of dollars uh, or whatever currency they have tons now and you will get the monthly extra monthly q a audio i just recorded that this week as well it's around 50 minutes of q a when i answer all your questions a whole load of questions on all different topics so uh, the q a audio is is for patrons only you can support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen right let's get into the interview Shane Miller is the author of Urban Fantasy Thrillers and Craft Guides for Writers, as well as a story coach and editor. Today, we're talking about how to write brilliant beginnings, crafting your novel's opening chapters made easy. So welcome, Shane. Thanks for having me on the show, Joanna. Oh, no, it's good to have you here. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and the indie author world. So way back in 2010, I read the first novel in Jim Butcher's Harry Dresden series. And in my youthful naivety, I kind of thought, I can do that. That'll be fine. So I wrote the most terrible vampire urban fantasy novel you will ever read. I did what 99.9% of writers do. I stuck it in a drawer. I let it gather dust while I fell into a quote unquote sensible corporate job. I found that manuscript in late 2018, skimmed it through and promptly realised just how awful it was. And as sobering as that experience was, it made me want to write again, but do it a lot better this time. Uh, With that in mind, I did what any self-respecting nerd would do, and I studied a lot. After a tonne of trial and error, I published the first four novels in my Myth and Magic Urban Fantasy series this year, as well as the first five guides for writers in my Write Better Fiction series, I also qualified as a Fictionary Certified Story Coach too. And that's pretty much me. That's how I got into it. Well, a few questions out of that then before we get into <laughs> beginnings. <laughs> well, you've told us a bit about your beginning, but what is your sensible corporate job? My sensible corporate job. So in my day job, I work for an insurance company. So it is very sensible, very corporate and very dull. It is not creative at all. And it's one of those kind of soul destroying cubicle slavery type jobs that I'm hopefully using writing as a way to transition out of. 
Mm, but absolutely pays the bills. I mean, looking back on my own corporate job as well, which I did for five years while building up my writing business, there are people who email me and they say they're a freelance writer writing for hire and they have nothing left for their creative work. Whereas with insurance and what I was doing with IT, I had a creative side that I wasn't using at work. So I just wanted to encourage people listening, if you have a similar job, it does actually leave you some creative space for writing. Yeah, it does. And writing is definitely the one good thing I would say if anyone out there is struggling with their day job, whatever that might be, is that you do have that creative outlet in writing and it does provide somewhat of an escape from the day job, even though you're still there. So just keep going and you will make a success of this and get out if you want to. Well, yes, if you decide (laughs) to do it. But then you said you launched the first four in your myth of magic and five guides for writers, right? And so are you following the rapid release type model and how has that gone? Well, I did this year. My word for this year was production and I kind of managed my schedule in a way that would allow me to do that. I will say it's very tiring, especially when you have a full-time job and it's not something that I will sustain going forward. I think there are a lot of loud voices in the indie space that kind of extol the virtues of rapid release. And I think it's great for the building an audience quickly and finding readers fast and all of those things. The question of whether it's sustainable or not is another one. And for me personally, I don't think it is. I think it can lead to burnout if you push too hard. And we all know how dangerous that is. <laughs> mm, well, I'm clearly not one of those loud voices <laughs> about rapid release. No, you're not. You're definitely not. <laughs> Uh, Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And obviously, having read your brilliant beginnings, I can see the work you've put into trying to figure out aspects of the craft. And I can see how much work you've done on that. And obviously, being in insurance, like you said, being a a geek, I'm also similar. We like to research. But let's get into that book. So how are you defining beginning? Because... (laughs) I mean, there there might be people listening who write short stories, novels, Mm -hmm. trilogies. So what is a beginning to you? Yeah, so I mean, specifically, I was thinking of novels when I wrote this book, because that's what I have experience in. And I define the first 10% of the novel as the beginning, and particularly in the digital reading age, because I think, well, you and I both know the way that people buy books, or at least search for books, has changed. You can go on to pretty much any one of the online stores now and download the first 10% of a book as a free sample. And readers can download as many samples as they like. So there's no barrier to entry, really. And then readers don't want to waste their time on stories that don't engage them fast. And you've said many times on the podcast that you give, I think you give a book three or four clicks on your Kindle before you decide whether to, to read on or not. Mm. Um, well, that's why um, <laughs> I wanted to ask about how, what you consider beginning, because you said they're 10%. So in a 70,000 word novel, that's 7,000 words. There is no way as a digital fiction read, I only read fiction digitally in ebook. There is no way I give a book 7,000 words. I mean, that's quite a lot. I give yeah. it, as you say, three or four clicks, which is probably less than a thousand words. Which is why it's so important. I mean, I define the beginning as 10% in as much as that's the entire sample. Obviously, the very beginning of your novel is that first few pages, and it is vital because of readers such as yourself, and I do it too. I probably give a book four or five clicks before I decide whether to purchase. Getting those initial opening pages right and really packing a punch with those is is vital because if that first sentence even doesn't grab your reader, then they may not even read on. So I think that's why I wanted to tackle this book first, because one of the things I realised when I read that awful novel that I wrote back in 2010 back was that the beginning was non-existent. It started far too early. There was a lot of, I got up, I brushed my teeth, I, all that stuff that we do when we're beginning writers. Because readers aren't hanging around now. If your book's opening falls flat, they'll just move on to the next one because they've got so many to choose from. So yeah, I think that's how I define beginning for the book and how I define beginning for the reader in terms of that first few pages. Mm, and we should say it's not just the sampling on an ebook reader i mean no. if you read in a bookstore you pick up a book you read the back then you yeah. might open it and read a few pages from the beginning or on an audiobook you might listen to the sample which is usually from the beginning so it's true whatever the format right yeah absolutely and even if readers search for paperback and they're not in a physical bookshop 
they can still view the sample of the paperback online. It's the same same difference, really. But yes, who hasn't gone into a bookshop, wandered around, picked up a few books, looked at the first few pages? So it is vital, whatever medium you're focusing on, certainly. Absolutely. Right. So you mentioned that obviously engaging readers quickly so give us some tips and not just for genre stories (laughs) like what about more literary stories because some people say start with a bang and I have definitely started books with an explosion (laughs) but I write action adventures so give us some thoughts on different types of beginnings that engage different types of readers yeah sure and I do have some thoughts on this and I've got three quick tips that you can use to hook readers quickly and this will work whether you're writing literary or genre fiction So the first thing is something that I call the invisible question, which is where you can craft your novel's opening line into a statement that essentially makes the reader ask themselves a question that they can only answer by reading on. Now, you mentioned literary fiction, and The Kite Runner is a great example of this. Um, That novel opens with the line, I became what I am today at the age of 12. Now, immediately as a reader, I would be asking, well, what are you today? And what happened when you were 12? And they can only get that answer by reading on. You mentioned thrillers, obviously, in genre fiction. The Da Vinci Code, again, fantastic example of an invisible question opening line with a museum curator staggering through a vaulted archway. The reader wants to know why he's staggering. Is he drunk? Is he injured? Is it something else? So by creating that question in the reader's mind, it sets up a cognitive dissonance that makes them want to read on. So that's a really quick tip you can use for your opening line. My second tip is to introduce a relatable point of view character on the first page. And when I say relatable, I don't necessarily mean nice or likable. There are plenty of characters like Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games, for example, who is not particularly likable. What I do mean is flawed. So readers identify with flawed characters because we're all flawed. And on a subconscious level, readers know that if your novel opens with a flawed character, They're going on an internal journey with them to fix that flaw because they've been consuming story for so long. They're used to that type of journey. And then my final tip is to open with some kind of tension or conflict. And this does still apply to literary fiction novels. So if you're writing something literary or a low action genre like romance, for example, you could open with some kind of argument or disagreement. If you're writing so-called high action genres like thrillers or fantasy, you could open with rather aptly your protagonist trying to defuse an unexploded bomb. You mentioned opening with an explosion earlier. So that would be the kind of thing you could use. But they're my three tips. I'd say the invisible question, opening with a relatable, not necessarily likable character, and opening with some kind of conflict to to hook the reader in. Mm, Those are some good tips. And I do think it's important, especially if we're talking about quite a short, even like the opening paragraph, you can't do everything, right? No, no. (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) That's impossible. Yeah, you can't do everything. You have to be selective. So just think of a few ways that you can hook your reader in, but they would be my sort of go-to ways that would work regardless of what genre. Yes, I think those are good. And it's also about tapping into the kind of reader you're after, but also the kind of uh, writer you are. So for example, sense of place is very important to me. You mentioned the Da Vinci Code and Mm -hmm. that curator is staggering through the Louvre and whatever Dan Brown's faults (laughs) he has some pretty epic settings and setting is so important and uh, but I did want to give an example I just a book I just read it's called The Paper Palace it's all over the charts at the moment in the US it's got all kinds of things and it it opens with a and it's I guess you'd say literary slash romance but the opening is just a description of a, a table like it's a really deep setting description and I don't normally read this type of book and yet when I sampled it I was like this is amazing and it kept me reading and it was a very deep setting description of a a cabin so I think for me as a reader I'm hooked in by sense of place so what about you as a reader like would you as a reader think about in terms of what hooks you so I think It's hard now because I've done so much work into the writing craft. I think it ruins how I read. But I think for me, the main thing that would hook me, and I very much read in the kind of urban fantasy, fantasy thriller genre myself. So for me, it would be getting into the story quickly or in medias res, if you want the fancy term, to kind of start in the middle of a scene, make sure that something happens relatively quickly. And also, I think for me, story is character. So as long as there's an engaging character, on the page 
I will be, I will read whatever genre, although I have my go-to ones, I will read whatever genre as long as the character is engrossing and I can identify them with them in some way or at least relate to them in some way. I'm going to pick on, up on something you said there. You said ruins mm-hmm. how I read. I want to challenge you on that and anyone else listening because it is a danger. And I I think from seeing your picture, you're at least a decade younger than me <laughs> and in actual years and probably in writing years. And I feel mm. like this, this is very, very important and people listening as well. We have to be able to switch off that brain because if mm. we if we lose the love of reading, then why bother? I mean, seriously. Yeah. It, it's so important. So I would really encourage you to try and come at the page with a different mindset. And like I said, picking up this paper palace was really interesting because I will never write a book like that. So it was very interesting to read it. And I read a lot of thrillers, but it's more difficult for me to disengage. Mm. I do you find reading outside my sort of primary genre really helps? And short stories are great. Anything to get back that joy of reading I think is is so important so are there ways you think you could let all this go and read with for pleasure again like go back to Jim Butcher (laughs) (laughs) yeah I think so and it seems to only affect the way I read when I'm writing non-fiction because I think I'm looking out for examples all the time because I write about craft that I can use and I'm kind of deconstructing the book as I go if I'm writing fiction I tend to find I can sink back into novels much more more easily but it is definitely a mindset thing for sure. (laughs) Mm, Well that's interesting too and again another thought on being a few books ahead of you is that you will run out of things you want to write about which is so I would say that perhaps once you've written the craft books that you feel called to write you'll be like okay I'm done I'm now going to (laughs) get into doing other things I totally relate to the type of person you are in terms of researching and wanting the sort of input and output is very similar to how I work as well but yeah I feel like there does come a point when you're like okay I've done my book on that like you don't need to write another book on openings right (laughs) (laughs) so I hope you can relax into it but just coming back to your book let's talk about signaling genre so for example so you talked about question you talked about character and conflict but that's not necessarily uh, signaling genre so how I mean fantasy is kind of obvious because I put some magic in it (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) but what are some of the other ways we can clearly signal genre so readers understand the promise of the book yeah certainly So I think one of the best ways to signal genre clearly, especially at the beginning of the novel, is to focus on the tone that you're trying to create. You'll find if you read lots of different genres, the tone is always different. And most genres have a tone that they evoke specifically for that type of genre reader. This applies to literary fiction as well. But I think it comes down to four main things. And that is the point of view intense that the novel is written in. For example, most YA dystopian novels are usually written in first person present tense, whereas epic fantasy novels, again, usually written in first person past tense. So that's one difference you could see when you read genre that would signal to you maybe what you're reading on a higher level. Character voice is another. So if you look at the genre I write in, urban fantasy, the tone is snarky, it's playful. Whereas if you looked at a cosy mystery set in the 1950s, then that tone definitely wouldn't work for that type of book. Something like weather, time of day, season that you start your novel in. So it's no coincidence that thrillers tend to start on cold, rainy nights and feel-good beach reads start on cloudless, sunny days. Chapter length is another thing to look at. So again, thrillers, an author like James Patterson, he has very short, very punchy chapters. And in general, thriller chapters, or at least the scenes that the chapters are made up of are shorter. And then again, with epic fantasy, they run a lot longer. And then one of the main things I think we can use, apart from, as you said, sticking magic in a fantasy novel, to signal what genre the reader is in for, is character archetype. So A romance novel will open with a single bachelor or bachelorette protagonist looking for love and something like the reluctant hero is really common in fantasy. So somebody who needs to go on a quest but doesn't actually want to go on the quest. So yeah, I think they're the main things we should look at when trying to signal genre to the reader Mm. in terms of tone. 
Yeah, I would definitely suggest reading the award-winning books in your genre. So, for example, I mm. often pop off the Bram Stoker list for horror. And I don't yeah. really write horror. I have aspects of horror. And I also chop off the thriller writers and you know if it's literary you could do the booker prize or whatever it is but essentially what I find is that the prize winners are a great example of that genre often they're standalone books as well they're not necessarily yeah. series it's hard to win a prize with a book in a series but I find that I learn a lot from that so for example Ararat by Christopher Golden when I read that I was like this is it this is an archetypal <laughs> horror novel that has everything I want and everything that wins a prize. And it did. It won the Bram Stoker. So looking at examples, the very, very clear examples of genre, I think can definitely help. I did want to bring up prologues because I actually think in your book, you don't like prologues, right? (laughs) It's a tricky one. My opinion has sort of changed since I wrote the book. So I'm happy to go into it. I like prologues and I often shop for a prologue. (laughs) Yeah. So... I'm not someone who's going to say you should never, ever do a prologue. When I wrote this book, I was writing for kind of newer writers. And obviously the easiest thing to do in terms of engaging a reader is to just start with your protagonist, usually in the present moment, to to kind of really bond your reader and your character together. Since I wrote that book, I've read some really fantastic prologues that have made me shift my perspective a bit. So an example of a fantastic prologue comes from Helen Scheurer's Curse of the Siren Queen series. And at the start of each book, the main character features as a child in the prologue. So it's set about 10 years before the main action of the novel, I think. And they act as a sort of subplot to the main plot. So there's clues and red herrings weaved into the prologue that make their way into the main plot. So you can do something like that. And I think you should consider what type of genre you're writing in as well and whether prologues are common. So in thrillers, for example, it's common perhaps to have a prologue that hints at the object or MacGuffin that the main character is going to chase. Or it could be a scene from the antagonist's point of view to show what they're doing at the start of the novel, their kind of evil plan that they're going to hatch. And I think readers expect that in certain genres. So there's much less risk of throwing them out of the story when you use a prologue. Whereas there are genres like romance that, you know, usually open in the present with the one of the love interests, usually the lead protagonist again. And I think because I was so conscious that I didn't want to overcomplicate matters as I was writing this book for newer writers, is that prologues are really difficult to write well. And particularly when I'm editing work for newer writers, they often use them as an excuse to info dump or world build through sheer exposition. It doesn't actually add anything to the story which I think is a surefire way to to turn readers off. So if you held a gun to my head, I'd probably say it's best where you can to jump in and feature the protagonist right away because it's less risky in terms of throwing the reader out. I remember reading, I think it was Master of Gin by P. Jelly Clark, and they have a scene as a prologue, which was a great scene, and it connected you to a character who then got murdered at the end of the prologue, which then threw me out of the story completely because I couldn't connect to the protagonist in the next chapter. So if you don't introduce your protagonist fast enough, readers may not identify them, which could lead to them putting your book down. So I'd say, again, a bit like you said earlier about looking at examples in your genre, if you know that your genre utilises prologues a lot or you just want to try one, get some best-selling books or books you like, have a look at the prologues and see if you think they work. Um, mm. So I have shifted my stance ever so slightly on prologues. <laughs> ever so slightly. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like my Tomb of Relics, it opens in the Tomb of Relics and it's a yeah. thousand years ago. And yeah. then what they find in the tomb, then we move into the present day and we see the result of what they found. So it's it's difficult because I also think, so I'm really happy with that within my Arcane series. I often mm. do have them yeah. because the writers who I emulate in some way writers like James Rollins, Steve Berry, that's something that they do. But it's interesting, as you were talking there, I have thought many times about rewriting my book, Desecration. And Mm. (laughs) because I (laughs) do have what is essentially a prologue in the voice of the uh, villain, the antagonist, and then it goes into a straight crime thriller. And the second book and the third book don't have that. And I think that it may put some people off. And 
the people who do read those books, they get my highest ratings, but not enough people read those books. So <laughs> I feel like it's interesting thinking about what a genre reader prefers and when we get it right and when we get it wrong and being honest about that. But a lot of these things you can only look back at when you have written and read a lot of books. So yeah, if you're listening and you're like, I love prologues, then go ahead. And if you don't, then don't worry about it. But let's just come back on character because I feel like there's a difficulty with revealing too much about a character and wanting to, you said, relatable character, but then also retaining enough mystery. So tell us more about that. Yeah, so I think knowing what to, you're right, knowing what to reveal about characters when a novel opens is really tough because we know so much about them. You know, we've done all the character questionnaires and filled out their traits and stuff, and we want to share that with the reader. But we also have a tendency to overshare, which bores the readers. And like you said, it doesn't leave any element of mystery. So I think the best way to reveal enough about our characters and particularly our protagonists, at least in the beginning of the book, is to introduce their flaw in a really clear way early on. You don't really have to to introduce much more than that, I would say, about your character at that stage. So our main aim is to obviously get readers to connect with characters quickly. And as I've said before, revealing the flaw works so well because readers are all flawed and it helps them to relate. And again, you also asked about leaving questions open for a later reveal. By opening with a character's flaw, you're subconsciously alerting the reader that they'll go on a journey of change with the character and the mystery surrounding that or the question this will raise in the reader's mind is what obstacles is the character going to face that force them to change and how exactly will they change? And this is going to sound odd considering I also have a book on plotting in my Write Better Fiction series, but readers come to story, I really believe, for character transformation to a greater or lesser extent depending on genre, of course, and not plot. So revealing that character flaw really early on, I think, is the best way to reveal enough without revealing too much about them. Mm, I'm a thriller reader. <laughs> and I'm, we love plot. <laughs> we are plot yeah, know, heavy know, in the thriller niche. I know, I know but... Yeah, so I think what's interesting about the traditional story structure is that it generally starts with this protagonist's current world set up and if you read the screenwriting books there's a certain percentage of the book where it's like this is the protagonist's current world then the inciting incident comes along and disrupts that world and we get into it so even if you want to start with the action you still need some element of the protagonist's current world but I wonder given (laughs) how short attention spans are are we shrinking this aspect of current world Yeah, I think the tried and tested kind of three-act structure still works in as much as the inciting incident can occur somewhere between the 10 and 15% mark because it's so ingrained in the subconscious thanks to Hollywood blockbuster movies. But you're right, readers' attention spans are shorter because don't forget, we're not just competing for readers' attention with other books now or even movies. It's Netflix, it's gaming, it's pretty much any other form of entertainment you can think of. It's so easily accessible. So obviously. A book is much longer than your reader's favourite Netflix show, or at least an episode of your reader's favourite Netflix show. So there is an argument to be made for staging an early inciting incident. Readers do want something to happen fast because they're so used now to things happening fast on their TV screens. And again, I think it is genre dependent. So epic fantasy readers still enjoy discovering the world and you've probably got longer to engage them than you would a thriller reader, say, who wants some kind of disruption to the norm within the first few scenes. So depending on the genre you're writing in, if you are writing in a really high action genre, I'd say there is an argument to be made for, I mean, some authors even kick off with the inciting incident and leave the world building until a bit later, or at least setting the stage for the normal world a bit later. So yeah, genre dependent, I would say on that one, which probably isn't very helpful. But yeah, it is a tricky one because there's so much competing for readers' attention these days. Mm, 
absolutely. And I think it's curiosity it, that you have to arouse the reader's curiosity. Mm. Again, I'm just going to keep coming back to the Paper Palace because it is not a thriller. It's a, a love story and it's literary. And within the first 1% is a line, which I won't read because it has a rude word in. <laughs> but it is a line that made me read on. I started reading for this beautiful description of a setting and then I read on because this one line made me go, oh, right, what is going on? And so it's almost the hook for the reader has to be curiosity to know more, regardless of genre, regardless of what whatever that may be. It might be character, it might be mystery, it might be MacGuffin, it might be love, whatever it is. But that hook is has to be curiosity. And that, to me, is what you have to do within the first couple of clicks. Otherwise, you've lost them. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's why I rely on the invisible question so heavily. So you do need something to to pique readers' curiosity, because without that, they are just going to put your book down, unfortunately, and go and binge Netflix, because it's easier than trying to get into your book if their curiosity is not piqued. Mm, no, absolutely. So just coming around to your your process, so mm. you write fiction and nonfiction. So what are the differences for you in your writing practices for each? Yeah, really really different I found I wasn't expecting there to be such a difference but there definitely is so in terms of my writing process I'm usually a hardcore plotter when it comes to fiction so I plot out my characters my locations my beats and my scenes well ahead of time and the process of getting words is slower relatively speaking in terms because I have to do all that plotting beforehand and I'm also, you've mentioned research, I'm so prone to falling down research rabbit holes, especially anything to do with mythology, which is basically what my novels are based around. So I have to keep a really close eye on that. Otherwise, I'll never start the book. Um, when it comes to nonfiction, I'm much less of a plotter, which is weird. I tend to have a pretty clear idea of what the problem is that I'm trying to solve and the steps I need to include. So it's all in my head when I start writing. I discovery write my nonfiction essentially and then order it later or go back and reverse engineer some kind of outline. And I'm far more focused, which is odd when it comes to research for nonfiction. I'll have already identified the exact books I need to use and the resources I want to pull quotes from. And I'm fairly good at staying on track, which makes the process of writing nonfiction for me much faster as well, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, it's the first time we've talked and I just see so much of my own process in you. <laughs> Have you done the Clifton Strengths thing? I have, of course. I know Sasha, so she bullied me into it. Yeah, she bullied me too, in a good way, <laughs> Sasha, if you're listening. And I'm yes, very grateful. I learned grateful. a lot. But what were, your, so what were your top five? So my top five are futuristic. I have deliberative at number two. I have learner at number three, communication at number four and competition. Oh, okay. So I was going to say you must have learner in there, and I do. Yeah, as well. I have input at six as well. So I've got yes, and I have in input. My yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Le- if you do your Clifton Strengths and you have learner and input, you do need to watch out for how much research you do. Like my pilgrimage book that I'm writing at the moment, which is nonfiction slash memoir. I've got notes on around thirty five books around pilgrimage and walking and I'm re- look, reading all my notes going I cannot possibly include all yeah. this stuff <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that happens so much I'm a chronic overwriter with my nonfiction, and I really have to pare it back to get a decent simple message across you, there's no way to include it all <laughs> no no exactly and then I also wanted to ask you because I just did a survey as we recall mm. this I just finished the survey and one of the thing that people did say is that they do want to hear from people who've started at, d- at different times so I started self-publishing way way back now in 2007 2008 yeah. and you said you put those books out this year right you started self-publishing yeah. in 2022 yeah. Yeah. so As someone who started self-publishing and book marketing this year, what are you doing? Like, what have you learned in that process and what's working for you? Yeah. So in terms of marketing, again, it couldn't be more different between the kind of fiction, nonfiction split. As much as it really pains me to say it, one of the only ways I've found to get real traction with fiction is paid advertising, whether that be paid newsletter promos like bargain books that you free books, all that kind of stuff, or things like AMS ads, Facebook ads. And I made a very conscious decision because I published Fiction First to launch my urban fantasy series into KDP Select because urban fantasy, at least in the indie space, is quite heavily dominated by KU authors. That's what readers are used to. So it kind of made sense. I'm not saying I'll stay 
exclusive to KU forever, but at least to build a reader base, that seemed like the smart thing to do. In terms of nonfiction, it's 10 times easier to market. And a lot of the principles that you teach, Joanna, in your books around content marketing, they very much still apply, in my opinion, for, for nonfiction. You can choose stronger keyword phrases in terms of SEO and discoverability. And that goes for titles, subtitles, the seven keywords Amazon allows, and the keywords that you use for manual targeting in any paid ads you do decide to run. And like I said, content marketing for nonfiction is much easier. So this interview, for example, it's much easier for me to gain traction from a podcast like this or any podcast interviews that I do, generally speaking, than it is for a fiction author trying to do the same thing. I'm not saying it's impossible, but, but they're the kind of key crucial differences I've found that it's much easier to craft a marketing message that you can use for evergreen content marketing than it is for fiction in my limited experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, I, I feel like the nonfiction side probably hasn't changed in well since the beginning of the internet I mean it literally yeah. is if you have the right keywords and just as a comment on you pitching me you did a great pitch because one well, your book title how to write brilliant beginnings <laughs> as a podcaster it's like well here you go here is a title for the podcast episode yeah. and it's much easier for me as the podcaster to get a book that encapsulates a specific topic it makes it easy for me to prepare it makes it useful for the audience who know they want an episode on that topic it's it's easier to sell, whereas fiction obviously is much more difficult. But in mm. terms of, uh, let's talk about email then. So have you, are mm. you building one email list or two? So I'm building two. I use ConvertKit and I segment the list between fiction readers and non-fiction readers. And I keep them fairly separate because they're very, very different messages. But I do find again with, I think the email list is, if I was going to say what is the most important marketing tactic you can use in 2022. The email list is definitely one of them. And I know people always say, oh, email's dead. The age of email is done. Just go on TikTok or whatever. I don't agree. I think email marketing, at the end of the day, you've got access to your customers then in a way that you won't have on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram or any of those things. And provided that you can craft engaging emails to either your fiction or non-fiction readers, I think you'll much be much more likely to convert them to super fans like as David Gochran would say because you have that space in their inbox that you know you're not going to have on their Facebook feed and you can do a lot of things with your mailing list you can find out what their likes and dislikes are you can hold polls you can ask them questions it's something that you wouldn't have access to otherwise and I definitely think if you're starting now start your mailing list at least three months before you need to. I wish I'd started mine slightly earlier than I did now. <laughs> I love to hear this because email marketing has been a staple for, again, like 25 years and that yeah. hasn't changed. And I get so many emails. People say, oh, the, everything's changed in marketing, but actually it has not. And the principle of owning your online real estate. I mean, you said there, don't build it entirely on Facebook or TikTok mm. or whatever. I would also say, don't build your entire business on KU. Now I know why you've done that with your initial books, but the yeah. same thing can happen. The algorithms change, you lose access as many authors have, something switches. And if you build an audience on email as well, you can always reach people if you have to shift your business model which many of us have done over over the years so I want everyone to reflect that what you've said is actually nothing different <laughs> nope <laughs> no it won't change I think the basics of marketing will never change and in in regards to the KU thing actually you raised an interesting point I again I consciously didn't go KU for my non-fiction because it didn't make sense for that business model so it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing I think a lot of writers kind of think oh I have to be all exclusive or all wide, but that's not necessarily the case either. You can make decisions based on different series or different projects if you write standalone books too. 
Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I'm experimenting as we record this, it might be different when anyone's listening, (laughs) but Desecration, for example, is in KU right now. That crime trilogy is in KU because I'm experimenting with it. But that's been wide for like almost a decade, I guess, which is crazy. And (laughs) you can do these experiments over time and you can use email marketing to direct people to wherever your books are, including like my Shopify store. So I love that you're doing that. So before we run out of time then, what is your your plan in terms of your career you must have quite an aggressive business plan to put out what nine books this year and really going for it as well as working so what do you hope to achieve let's say in the next three years or when do you want to leave so yeah in the next three years I hope to be doing this full time and that's why I am being so aggressive with my business plan and I get a lot of people on Instagram asking me why I'm being so aggressive. If you don't want to do this full time, that's absolutely fine. But that is one of the things that is a definition of success for me because I am unhappy in my day job. So in order to get out of that, and I do have, we've touched on strengths, I do have number five competition. And the person that I compete most with is myself. So I want to achieve my goals as as quickly as possible. For me, that's getting out of the day job. So in terms of the plan going forward, It will be to upscale the nonfiction in terms of providing higher price items like online courses, et cetera. Um, I will be scaling the editing side of my business to support that income because although it's active income, it's nice, easy income that I can use to to leverage a bit more money and plow it back into the business. And then with my fiction, I think the rapid release for fiction isn't for me. So it will be a much slower release pattern and building an audience over time rather than trying to kind of ram my fiction down people's throats straight away. <laughs> mm. No, interesting. Okay, so what are we, 20, so, so 2025, yes. you can pitch me again. <laughs> 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 and if I'm still podcasting, which you never know, I mean, it's, know. it's still going. I hope um, so, because it's a great show. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I mean, I think what's nice though, talking to someone like you, I can see aspects of, like I said, the way I work and the way I've built my business. And what would be interesting to see if your trajectory is similar to mine, even though I started 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Because as we said, things <laughs> some things change, but a lot doesn't change. No, no, that's quite right. And there's a, again, it comes down to loud voices. So a lot of people say, oh, this has changed, that's changed. But when you strip it back, it's really the same basic principles. You just have to tweak your tactics a bit to to kind of account for maybe a shift in how much advertising costs or whatever. But the basic principles, I think, will always be the same. Mm, absolutely. Right. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? So you can find everything about me and my books at swmiller.com. If you want to find me on social media, I am on Instagram and TikTok at swmillerauthor. And if you want to listen to my brand new podcast with my amazing co-host, you can head over to storytellersfaceoff.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Shane. That was great. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Shane and that it gave you some ideas about your books and also inspiration for your author business, even if you only started publishing this year as Shane did. So let me know what you think. Leave a comment on the show notes or the YouTube channel. Tweet me at the creative pen or email joanna at the creative pen dot com. So next week, it's Halloween, and I'm talking to Jennifer Hilt about the importance of genre tropes. And uh, appropriately, our examples are from the horror genre, but neither of us like slasher or gore horror, which is only one subgenre, really. Uh, but we both enjoyed Stranger Things and Midnight Mass. And we also talk about, uh, obviously, those are TV shows, not books. Um, but we also talk about comedy horror, supernatural horror, and uh, more. It's going to be a useful episode, even if you don't write or read horror, horror, (laughs) because the principles of tropes apply across genres and our examples will help you come up with your own. So it's a fun discussion. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, 
you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.